These are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this is Nick Weiner of Open Channels. Co-hosting with me is Sarah Carr of the EVM Tools Network. Uh, presenting for us today are Kendra Carr, Rod Fujita, and Willow Batista of the Environmental Defense Fund, who will be explaining their work with assessing data-limited fisheries with the Framework for Integrated Stock and Habitat Evaluation, also known as FISHI. Uh, quick note before I hand the mic over to them and let them introduce themselves. Uh, you'll notice a small arrow, a little red arrow in the top right-hand corner of your screen. If you click that, you can show or hide the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, so if you show the GoToWebinar control panel, you'll notice there's a little questions box in there. If at any time during the webinar you have a question, just type it into that, block, or that box. Uh, Sarah and I will collect those and relay them to the presenters at the end of the webinar. And if you have any technical issues, just type it in there and we can help you right away. Uh, so this webinar is being recorded. I'll post it on openchannels.org slash webinars in a few hours after that's over. Uh, if you want a direct link to the webinar, you can just reply back to Sarah Carr's uh, registration confirmation email that you got from GoToWebinar. Uh, Kendra, Rod, and Willow uh, will be presenting for about 30 to 40 minutes, which gives us a good chunk of time at the end of the webinar uh, to answer questions. So if you have any questions, again, just type them there in the questions panel, and we'll get to those. Uh, and with that, I'll hand the microphone over to Rod. Thank you, Rod. Well, thanks, Nick. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Rod Fujita. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, I am a scientist with the Environmental Defense Fund's Oceans Program. Uh, the Environmental Defense Fund is a uh, U.S. nonprofit. Uh, we are now working in about uh, 11 countries around the world uh, with about 100 staff uh, dedicated to improving fisheries management. Uh, these staffers work in a huge range of governance uh, and ecological contexts uh, and for, in fisheries ranging from the highly developed and highly industrialized uh, to the smallest uh, scale subsistence fisheries. And uh, in the course of this work over the last 25 years, we've uh, learned some lessons and uh, we get an awful lot of questions from folks we work with uh, in fisheries many of which have centered around uh, how to do the science necessary to support uh, good fisheries management. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to uh, walk you through uh, a framework that we've developed uh, to extract as much management guidance as we can from what limited data uh, are available in fisheries. So let's start at the beginning. What is the problem we're trying to solve here? I think we all recognize that uh, we manage what we know uh, and we tend to ignore the rest. And so it's not surprising uh, to think that the fisheries that we know something about, in other words, the ones that have been scientifically assessed, uh, you would think that they would do better <clears throat> in fulfilling their goals than fisheries we know nothing about because we've never studied them. And uh, while it's difficult to kind of test this hypothesis, um, some really clever scientists led by Chris Costello at the University of California in Santa Barbara uh, managed to estimate the biomass status of a whole bunch of fisheries that were not formally assessed by looking at their catch rates over time and the life history characteristics of the populations they were targeting. And they found, lo and behold, that indeed um, the fisheries that were not assessed were performing pretty badly. Uh, you can see that they're nowhere near uh, the sustainability target. Uh, whereas the fisheries, which tend to be large in scale, that uh, were scientifically assessed tend to be doing uh, better. And because uh, a lot of the unassessed fisheries are small in scale, you know, less than about uh, 10,000 metric tons per year, uh, and because these small-scale fisheries uh, appear to be very much more common than large-scale fisheries, maybe in the 10 or 20,000 range around the world, um, it's probably safe to conclude that um, the vast majority of the world's fisheries are underperforming relative to their potential to produce food, uh, to provide good jobs, and to protect uh, ecosystems. Well, where are these fisheries? It's not going to surprise uh, you to find that uh, these unassessed small-scale fisheries are distributed mostly in the tropics and subtropics uh, with a smattering uh, in Europe and, and North America. Well, how do we fix this problem? 
First of all, um, if it's true that fisheries do better when we know something about them, then we've got to figure out their condition. How's the fishery doing? We also know, though, to, in order to do scientific management, we need to know where the fishery wants to go. What is its goals? What are the aspirations of the fishermen and managers? What are the targets, in other words, that management is going to aim at? And equally important, we want to know what to stay away from. Uh, what are the dangerous thresholds? Where is the uh, point at which the stock is not going to be able um, to produce fish sustainably? Or what is the point at which the ecosystem might collapse? So we've got to find the limits. And uh, <laughs> probably a lot of you are on this webinar because you found that the conventional approach to figuring out the answers to these questions um, uh, conventional stock assessment, in other words, uh, is probably not feasible in your fishery. You may not have long uh, time series of catches. You may not have a fancy uh, fishery independent survey to tell you what the biomass is. Uh, you might not have the expertise to assemble a really complicated stock assessment model. Well, the good news is that uh, over the last 50 or 60 years, um, scientists have been busily developing methods to uh, get a snapshot of the condition of a fishery stock um, that depend on way less data than a complex stock assessment does. And these tools um, all have different kinds of data needs, some of them you know, runoff of catch data, some of them run off of length composition uh, in the catch, some of them run off of uh, visual surveys that are conducted in, uh, uh, in the water by scuba divers. So a bunch of different data needs, and they all produce different things, different outputs. Um, there's no silver bullet here. You know, you, you can't take a single data poor uh, stock analysis tool and get all the answers you need to manage out of that. So uh, we tend to recommend that people use several um, and see if they corroborate each other. And uh, even though these data poor tools require way less data and are really fast to calculate, and sometimes it's as simple as you know taking the ratio of two numbers, sometimes it's more complicated using a little equation, but they're, they're pretty fast and easy. But that doesn't mean that they're easy to use. Uh, there's a trade-off here um, because these data port tools are just showing you a little sliver of what the stock might be doing. Uh, the real trick here and the difficult part is interpreting the results, and we'll get into that later in the webinar. But I don't want to leave the impression that uh, you know these data port methods are super quick and super easy and super easy to use. Um, it, it requires nuance and a lot of careful interpretation. Um, so you've got all these tools, and they have all these different outputs, and there's no silver bullet. How do you figure out which methods to use for what? And then how do you use the outputs of these, uh, these tools? Um, we got this question a lot from our partners in all these countries, and we decided that it would be useful to construct some kind of a systematic framework for figuring out which tools to use when, uh, what questions can they answer, and that would allow the users of this framework to extract uh, really useful management guidance from these data port tools. And that's exactly what the framework for the integrated um, uh, stock and habitat evaluation is, FISHI. Uh, it's a step-by-step -step process uh, that walks the user through uh, the uh, analysis of ecosystem condition. Um, and uh, how to apply some simple uh, data point methods to assess uh, stock condition. Uh, and it has a prioritization mechanism because a lot of our partners and many of you on the webinar uh, may have some resource constraints, particularly if you're working with fisheries that are not producing huge amounts of revenue but are really important for food security and supporting people's jobs. Um, so they tend to be undervalued by government agencies uh, who don't make the investment in collecting data, but they are really valuable for the people who are, are fishing in them and, and live in these coastal communities. So we need to prioritize, and uh, FISHI also contains 
a, uh, a way to integrate all the outputs of these data port tools into a management framework. So let's start with uh, trying to get a handle on how the ecosystem is doing. This may seem a little unusual. Um, if you come from a fisheries science background, we don't often ask uh, how the ecosystem is doing. But um, it's clear that it's an important question in fisheries management because the ecosystem is what supports the entire fishery among many other ecosystem goods and services. Uh, if you don't do ecosystem assessment, it's kind of like a doctor trying to assess the condition of a patient without knowing anything about how they live or what their house is like, et cetera. So uh, we need to figure out how the ecosystem is doing so that we can figure out whether it's sufficiently healthy to support a really intense fishery. Um, and the other big question is uh, because ecosystems are subject um, to all kinds of things uh, like pollution and dams and uh, mining operations and ports and so forth, um, these all introduce impacts uh, to the ecosystem on top of the fishery. And so we need to determine whether the ecosystem is uh, so heavily impacted that no matter what we do with the fishery, no matter how far down we crank the catch limits or size limits or gear restrictions, um, the stock may not respond. That's an important question for uh, determining whether a, a fishery intervention will work or not. So these ecosystem assessment uh, tools fall into two really general categories. One category uh, holds uh, qualitative risk assessment tools that depend a lot on local knowledge. Uh, it's a great way to integrate um, what fishermen know uh, about fisheries and what local experts know about ecosystems, stick that information together and come up with a risk assessment. Uh, there's also um, some quantitative uh, methods for uh, assessing uh, ecosystem risk. In qualitative risk assessment, generally what you do is uh, you try to turn, because you don't have much quantitative data, you try to turn the qualitative knowledge that your stakeholders have into uh, some kind of quantitative score by asking them to think about the various things that are going on in the ecosystem and then scoring them on attributes associated with the severity of their impact like what's the aerial extent of the mariculture or uh, where does the pollution go and what kinds of habitats does it impact. So you, you take that kind of qualitative knowledge and then you, um, uh, you rank uh, these attributes uh, according to a set of criteria uh, designed to, to ensure consistent scoring. Um, and then you do the same thing for the ecosystem except this time you score attributes of the ecosystem that are related to its resistance uh, to impact. In, in other words, its resilience, its ability to recover uh, or resist uh, impact. Um, a lot of these qualitative tools, uh, if you've ever tried to use them, you'll see that the authors usually end with a paragraph saying, this is all nice, but you really ought to build a quantitative model and go to the next level uh, for, for management. Um, I think that a lot of these qualitative assessments are probably good enough. They give you a good sense of uh, how the ecosystem is doing and what the other threats are doing uh, to your fishery. But um, if you do happen to be working in the Indian Ocean on coral reefs or in the Caribbean on coral reefs, um, there's a new quantitative uh, assessment tool that uh, is on Fishy that you can take a look at. This is based um, on the very well-documented concept that coral reefs can exist in multiple states and can transition rather suddenly from a very healthy state that's producing <clears throat> lots and lots of fish and lots and lots of other goods and services and is quite resilient to a state that's degraded in all those respects. It's producing less ecosystem services, including uh, fisheries. Um, the uh, data, uh, massive amounts of data that have been collected on coral reef ecosystem metrics and fish biomass over uh, many years 
uh, across many, many countries in the Indian Ocean and in the Caribbean, all point to uh, this concept. They all support this concept that these coral reefs exist in multiple states. And now that we've put to, together the data, Tim McClanahan in the Indian Ocean and Kendra Carr in the coral reef uh, of the Caribbean, uh, we can see that uh, there are these quantitative thresholds related to how many fish are in the system. Again, not surprising because fish are known to be important regulators of ecosystem processes. And so uh, you would expect perhaps that uh, as you remove uh, fish from the system, it would become less and less resilient and more prone to changing state. Uh, but uh, now we have the numbers um, that managers can use to assess the risk uh, because we now know, for example, in the Indian Ocean that if your fish biomass is up around um, 1,100 kilograms per hectare or so, uh, you have very low risk of uh, e ecosystem change. Uh, but as it drops and gets closer to 600 kilogram kilograms per hectare, um, things start to change. Uh, there's a very sharp decrease in the, in the intensity of predation, for example. Again, not surprising because the predatory fish tend to get fished out first. And then when, the, when you remove more fish and you get down around the 400 kilogram per hectare level, uh, all of the species richness indicators kind of drop precipitously. And uh, finally, when the fish biomass drops down below about uh, 300 uh, kilograms per hectare, you get this precipitous uh, change in many uh, indicators, including the hard, hard coral. So you see this kind of sequence of uh, states from a coral-dominated system all the way down to a system dominated by macroalgae. Um, we uh, have taken these uh, quantitative assessments and this very data-rich analysis and tried to turn it into a data-poor tool that doesn't require much data at all. Uh, for managers to use in the field. So um, the way it works is that uh, the, if you have a visual census, for example, uh, that's uh, measuring the number of fish uh, per hectare uh, inside and outside a no-take marine reserve, and you feel reasonably confident that the marine reserve is well enforced and uh, is, is truly an unfished um, reference point. Uh, then uh, you can uh, take these numbers and compare them uh, to these thresholds that are generalized from the data analyses in the Indian Ocean and the Caribbean Reef. Uh, and uh, we, do, we kind of standardize it to your local condition because all coral reef systems are different uh, by taking the ratio of the uh, density of fish on your fishing grounds uh, divided by the density of fish in your marine reserve. And, uh, you know, if it's close to one, if that ratio is close to one, you have uh, a very low risk of change. Uh, but, you know, as it approaches about 0.5, uh, we start to see these early warning signs, and you should probably monitor things. You may be approaching a tipping point. Um, <clears throat> it looks like uh, for most of the coral reefs in the Indian Ocean and in the Caribbean, um, between, you know, around 0.4 to 0.6 is an area where ecosystem recovery is potentially possible. Uh, but when you cross this threshold at about 0.3 um, uh, fish density to unfished density, uh, you may have gone over the edge to a macroalgal dominated state, which uh, might be quite difficult to recover from. And uh, this sort of analysis um, is is generalized, right? I mean, you would need to do a, a pretty careful analysis of your own coral reef system to use this to make hard decisions about whether to reduce the entire fishery and cause fishermen a lot of pain. Uh, but um, it is useful for uh, guiding adaptive management and particularly for taking precautionary actions. So if your fish densities are quite low uh, relative to your unfish densities in your marine reserves, uh, it may merit, actually, a reduction in aggregate fish catch uh, in a multi-species fishery. So uh, we've got a handle on the ecosystem. Because a lot of small-scale fisheries that are unassessed are unassessed because 
they're catching 30 or 50 or 70 species, and that makes it hard, um, there is a risk of serial depletion. Um, this is the classic multi-species management problem that you've all encountered, I'm sure. Uh, and then the question becomes, well, uh, which of those 50 or 60 species do we focus on? And um, Fishy directs you to uh, something called the Productivity and Susceptibility Analysis. Uh, you'll find on the online tool uh, the spreadsheets that will do these calculations for you. But the hard work is to get your stakeholders together um, to, uh, again, turn qualitative knowledge into quantitative data and mix it with actual quantitative data on life history if you have it available to rank uh, the productivity of each stock in your multi-species fishery. And then also, and this is where the fisherman's knowledge really comes in handy and actually is essential, um, to rank attributes of uh, the fishery that are related to susceptibility. And with these two scores, uh, you, the tool computes uh, a vulnerability index that you can use to sort uh, the, the stocks into high risk, medium risk, and low risk species. Um, next, Fishy uh, directs you to try to take a stab at assessing the condition of the stock using some very uh, simple to calculate tools, but again, uh, sometimes difficult to interpret. Um, there's a bunch of these available. You can see that some of them are based on traditional fisheries data like uh, length uh, composition in the catch, uh, and some of them give kind of traditional fishery outputs like spawning potential ratio, but others are look a little strange. Uh, they're based on visual census uh, because visual census data seems to be fairly common uh, in tropical coral reef systems where fishery data are not. And uh, there's a lot of MPAs all over the place, and these are great uh, for getting an, um, a pretty good estimate of unfished biomass, which is normally a very, very difficult parameter to estimate using fisheries data. So that's one advantage that these small-scale tropical fisheries have, is if you've got an MPA, you're way ahead of the game. Um, they all have different costs and capacities associated with them, and there's this handy matrix in Fishy that you can use to take a look at your data streams that you have and then uh, match them up with the uh, methods that might work to do each of the steps of Fishy. So just as a quick illustration, um, if you don't have any catch data and nobody's been um, uh, looking at the size uh, of the fish in the catch and nobody knows you know, how old the fish are or anything like that, but a bunch of scientists have been doing scuba surveys for years uh, inside and outside marine reserves because they're interested in trying to find out how the marine reserve is performing, you can sort of turn that around and uh, just calculate the ratio between the uh, fish density on the fishing grounds and the fish density in the marine reserve. Uh, the ratio of those two numbers is the MPA density ratio. In this case, back in the 90s, you know, obviously the rockfish were not doing well at all, and the density ratio here is, is tiny, indicating that the rockfish population is, is in terrible shape. Uh, and uh, here in Belize, uh, in Glover's Atoll, a very well-managed uh, reef fishery, uh, we've got a, a much higher MPA density ratio for groupers, indicating that um, these guys are doing okay. Now, uh, we have uh, information on the vulnerability of the individual stocks in their fishery, and we've got a preliminary estimate of uh, how depleted they might be, and with those those two types of information, we can start to prioritize these stocks. So uh, remember, we did the PSA and we grouped uh, stocks into low, medium, and high vulnerability groups. We also can group um, stocks after you do these depletion analyses into low, medium, and high depletion. And obviously, um, each of these cells uh, will have different implications for management. So if you have a highly vulnerable stock, uh, that's also a show of signs of being highly depleted. This is a category which may merit uh, a complete ban on fishing that stock to allow it to recover, uh, and you would anticipate pretty slow rebuilding because one of the reasons what stocks are highly vulnerable is often related to their uh, low productivity. 
And uh, on the other hand, you know, if you have a, a medium vulnerability stock that's not depleted at all, uh, that might be an opportunity for um, uh, harvest uh, to take some of the fishing effort that's displaced or dislocated from a ban on a high priority stock. So you can develop guidance for each of these cells. And uh, now we're ready to uh, really get into adaptive management. Uh, after you um, do a more detailed assessment, if you have more data, um, if you don't, you can stick to the, uh, the assessment methods you use in step three. And again, you can refer to the methods matrix to find uh, which methods might fit your data streams. Um, but we, we have been uh, recommending and actually implementing in a couple of countries uh, this adaptive management framework, which I think um, takes advantage of um, the fact that uh, you can do a bunch of different data pool analyses pretty quickly, but it also uh, serves to mitigate uh, the uncertainty associated with these data pool methods by looking at them all together and then interpreting them together uh, to make sure, to, for example, if they corroborate each other, that's a good thing and our uncertainty is low and we feel like we have a robust scientific basis for management. If they do not corroborate each other and they're going in different directions, then it forces um, uh, fishermen and local experts and managers to sit down together and figure that out in a participatory process. What do these signals mean? What is a plausible explanation for those signals? And what do we do about it? So uh, the first step in adaptive management um, is to design the adaptive management plan. This is best done ahead of time. You don't want to be doing this on the fly uh, while your fishery is operating because you want to have rules in place um, uh, to guide your management throughout the fishery season. So it's very participatory. You get your stakeholders together. Uh, you try to articulate clear goals for the fishery. Um, it's usually pretty easy to identify key target species based on that goal, but sometimes um, I've found that it's useful to probe this a little bit and ask people, uh, for example, okay, these are the species you're catching right now. Obviously, they're key. You depend on them, but what did your dad catch you know, 20 years ago or what did your grandfather catch 50 years ago? And that will give you some insight sometimes into what you might recover and, and give you some new targets for rebuilding. Um, the next step is to uh, think carefully about those goals and develop a few um, performance indicators. Uh, it might be catch unit effort uh, compared uh, over time, over the last five years, or it could be the MPA density ratio. It could be sp uh, uh, spawning potential ratio. Um, and then uh, you, uh, of course, have to develop data collection uh, strategies if you don't have those data streams coming in so that you can calculate uh, these performance indicators. Um, and uh, the group, the, the stakeholders, also have to choose um, reference points uh, for each indicator. So, you know, what is the target for catch unit effort? What is the target for MPA density ratio? What is the target for spawning potential? And uh, what are the limits? You know, how low can we let SPR go before we do something? Uh, how far does CPU have to drop until it triggers action? Um, those kinds of considerations define your harvest control rules. It basically says what the manager will do if the indicator is at some particular level, uh, below the limit, near the limit, um, near the target, or above the target. Um, once you have this plan in place, which is essentially a fishery management plan, and by the way, fishery, uh, con uh, fishery contains a template for writing a fishery management plan based on this adaptive management scheme, um, you can apply it. So you get the data together, um, you calculate the indicators that you've chosen, you know, you calculate the MPA density ratio, the SPR, fishing mortality, or whatever you've chosen. Uh, you then compare uh, uh, in the uh, indicator values uh, to the reference points that have been chosen. And then that triggers the harvest control rules. Uh, you adjust the harvest accordingly. And then you take a look next year to see how you did. So 
Um, there we have it. Uh, this is the framework for the integrated uh, stock and habitat evaluation. Uh, it's, uh, as I said, um, a pretty easy to follow stepwise process uh, for uh, looking at the condition of your ecosystem and your stocks, for prioritizing things for uh, more study or for precautionary management, and then for adaptively uh, managing them to uh, try to achieve your fishery goals. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Kendra, who will um, give you an online live demonstration of the tool. Uh, my pleasure. Hi, everyone. I am Kendra Carr, and um, I'm also a scientist with the Oceans Program of the Environmental Defense Fund. And so what I want to first start off with is just, you know, just I'm sure everyone on listening to this right now realizes that data limited science and assessment and management tools is, is a relatively new field. And because of that, methods are constantly being developed um, and being put out into the, the mainstream for us to use. So as this web page exists now, it's, it's a living web page. It's one that we're going to try to constantly um, evolve and in, in introduce new methods, as well as uh, methods that we might not have on the web page right now. As it exists, uh, these are the, method, the methods that I'm going to introduce you to briefly are the ones that we've found most useful uh, in working with our partners in various uh, countries. So uh, the web page is uh, fishy.edf.org. And as you view the web page, you can see uh, there's an introduction. And on the very bottom of the screen, there's a get started. And this is where we'll start. We'll actually push that get started button to, to introduce us to the framework uh, that Rod Vegeta just walked us through. So we have the same graphic that walks us through these six steps. And so what we're going to do is just introduce you to how each one of these steps works uh, on the web page and how you can use that uh, to really educate yourself about your fishery and move forward with management. So the first thing you're going to do is um, download this workbook we have. Um, and Rod already mentioned uh, the workbook. And inside of this workbook, we have guidance on how to use the web page, as well as a couple uh, sheets that you're going to fill out to record what type of data you have. You're going to characterize your fishery um, walk through an analysis of your governance to help you understand how to move forward with using this web page. And so on each one of these steps, you're going to record the data, and then ultimately you're going to end up um, using that information on the method matrix that uh, Rod mentioned. So I'm hoping this is looking fine, uh, lifetime. Um, so on the method matrix, we have a series of methods for each one of the six steps. And we can zoom in on this methods matrix and look at all the different types of data streams that are available. And so what you're trying to see is, where can I go right now with the data that I have, what methods fit the data I have, but also identify gaps that you can um, work on starting to collect that information in order to move forward with the framework. So now we're actually going to, now we record all this information. Um, our fishery characterization, as well as what data we have, we can actually start finding out what methods are useful for each one of the, the steps that we're walking through. So in our first um, step uh, Rod, that Rod mentioned is the ecosystem assessment um, method. And we have three, right now we have three methods that we're, we're using um, in the fisheries that we're working in. And two of them are risk-based uh, that Rod mentioned, and that's the ecological risk assessment for effects of fishing, as well as the comprehensive assessment of risk to ecosystems. And you'll notice that each one of these uh, methods has a little arrow next to it. And what that arrow does is it explains uh, what the tool is actually doing, as well as um, access to resources for this tool. So whether it's a, an explanation step-by-step -step guide or an actual spreadsheet uh, to run the model yourself. And then we also have another uh, method in step one that was quantitative. And here you actually have um, uh, uh, tools uh, that talk, talk through the, the method itself. And so you can use it in your system. And so the, these are the three options we have uh, for the first step. 
the second step is uh, determining vulnerability. And it's the same design where we have a brief introduction of why you're walking through this method, as well as once you click on the arrow and open the tool itself, it's access to step-by-step uh, -step guidance as well as uh, the actual uh, spreadsheets to run this model uh, on your computer so you don't have to be online and do it. Um, I do want to mention that um, many of these tools we have uh, translated into other languages, specifically Spanish, and, and this is part of that evolving process with this web page is, is making it more accessible to users that may not um, speak English. And, the PSA tool is a prime example of that, where we have a Spanish version available. So in the third step of, of the framework that Rod has walked you through, we have a few methods that we're recommending. And this is the MPA, MPA density ratio, the FROSI sustainability indicators, the mean length assessment, length-based reference points, and the spawning potential ratio. And so these are the methods that we've found useful um, in most of the fisheries uh, that we've been working in when, when they have minimal data needs. And then we're going to introduce a couple more uh, once you start doing your data collection scheme uh, to improve uh, the, your ability to assess and manage your fisheries. And so each one of these has uh, the same option where you, you open up the method itself and it has an introduction to how the method works as well as in, for this one specifically in the uh, workbook that you downloaded, there's, there's an actual Excel spreadsheet uh, to run this model. So while you're going through this process in this workbook that you've downloaded, you're going to be recording your answers um, that you've, whether it's a fishery characterization all the way to the different methods that you're using for your analysis. And those are going to help you with the fourth step. So in the fourth step of this toolkit, um, whether it's the downloaded version or if you're doing this online, you're going to prioritize your stocks based on um, the step two and the step three that you've already walked through. And this uh, step four is also available in the workbook that you've downloaded. And same with the fifth step. The, these, a lot of these tools are available, um, or at least introductions and guidance to these tools are available offline but they're also available online for those that have um, continual access to the web page. And so the methods that we're, we're suggesting to, once you've collected more data for these priority species is not only is the ones that we've suggested in step three, but also a few more methods that require more um, data, mostly catch-based data. Um, and this is the depletion cor correction and average catch, the depletion-based stock reduction analysis, um, Fractional change in lifetime aid production, uh, marine prote protection area based decision tree, and catch MSY. And so right now, um, as the web page exists, we mostly have a lot of information about how these methods work. If you were to click this open here, how, what, it, what is the background information for you to be able to use this method? Does the data you have actually fished answer the question that you want to answer with this type of uh, method? And because our goal is to make this a live web page and, and increase its functionality, we want to, in the future, include options to be able to use these methods online as well as offline. And, and that's a future goal. So as you walk through these six steps, um, each step has resources. That's the intent of the web pages right now. It's a warehouse of information that helps you organize the information you might have, whether it's from data or from local knowledge, um, in order to effectively use that information to manage your fish, fishery. So right now, it, it doesn't exist as an exhaustive um, uh, warehouse of data limit science, but that is the living part of the web page. It's going to be evolving over time with new methods and new information that um, you as our partners and those people that work on the ground that are finding really useful in order to move forward with assessing and managing their fisheries. So besides walking through these six steps and access to this uh, uh, method matrix, the web page also houses um, a case study. And, and this is a hypothetical case study. But the intent is, is for those people that maybe are, are unable to, 
to make this webinar or they're brand new to understanding how this framework works, it walks them through how we might approach working with this fishery through each one of the six steps um, and how to use and interpret the information you're gathering for each one of these six steps. And then otherwise, we also have a, a resource page. And this resource page houses a lot of the information um, that is available in the workbook, workbook that you download, as well as links to some of the manuscripts that have been published behind some of these methods, or a web page links to some of the partners that have created uh, various methods. So one thing uh, we wanted to do is also introduce um, uh, how part of the, how this web page is evolving over time. Um, there is new science being developed that will help us assess and manage many of these fisheries. And we want to be able to work with partners that are developing the science, whether to look at an individual method or to combine multiple methods um, and look at how those results are identifying what changes are occurring in the fishery that you're interested in. And so one example um, is some partners that we're working with in, in, at the NRDC, they've actually created a tool that will allow you to use many data limited methods at once um, based on the type of data you have, so it's structured to meet the needs of the data. Um, and so we are interested in incorporating these types of opportunities of working with partners such as the NRDC, our NRDC um, in order to increase the functionality of the web page, as well as for people to be able to um, assess their fisheries in the future. Um, and with this really brief introduction to the web page, I, I think it would be great to open up uh, to questions from the audience or suggestions and thoughts. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kendra. Um, so with that, if you have any questions, uh, just click the little red arrow in the top right-hand corner of your GoToWebinar control panel and that'll maximize the screen. And then there's a questions panel right there that you can type in your questions and then uh, we'll get those in. Uh, so we do have a couple questions right now that I can pose to you guys. Um, first one, does FISHI allow one to explore the effects of ocean climate change and eutrophication in coastal areas on fish stock biomass and productivity capacity? Well, I'll take a crack at that, but um, Willa, you might want to weigh in on this too, as Willa developed the comprehensive assessment uh, of risk to ecosystems tool, CareLite tool that's on FISHI, and that tool is intended to uh, be a way for your stakeholders and local experts to at least think about what climate change might do um, to stocks, but in a qualitative way. There, uh, there are no models in there that say that, you know, if you have a two-degree um, sea change in your coral reef, this is what's going to happen to your stock biomass. So it's it's much more about thinking about climate change as an additional risk factor and then uh, using that to score um, the impacts, which will then raise um, the risk score that you give to that system. Uh, it's much more about risk than about um, quantitatively assessing the impacts. But Willa, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, yeah, Rod, you, you covered it pretty well. Basically, CARE is a, is a site-specific tool, which means that when you're evaluating your uh, specific site that you're considering implementing fishery management or changing the fishery management, CARE allows you to consider all the other threats that face the ecosystem and the stocks within that site, including climate change. And so you can determine, based on the expert judgment and um, people who, you know, the managers who've been working in the system, for years, their knowledge, um, you could determine whether or not the effects of climate change are likely to sort of uh, overwhelm your, your management efforts. So if you were to reform your fishery management, but then climate change is going to come through and, and all your stocks are going to just totally move out of that site, then perhaps that's not the best place to focus your, your resources. So it yeah. does allow you to, to think about climate change in a sort of a precautionary manner like that. Yeah. Another quick point, um, uh, one of the advantages of using a marine reserve as a reference point for your fishery uh, as opposed to looking at um, catch records that go back 20 years. So usually when you're trying to estimate unfished biomass and use that as a baseline to see how your fishery is doing, 
um, you try to extrapolate what the biomass must have been if the catches were that high 20 or 30 years ago when the fishery started, right? That's your version of biomass. But um, that doesn't correct for the fact that the ocean has changed over those 20 or 30 years, including climate change. Um, so the marine reserve is a much more instantaneous uh, measure of what the fish population could do given all the things that are going on in the ocean today, including the climate change impacts. So um, it's kind of an internal control on the effects of climate change, and it's, uh, to my mind, not a bad way um, to assess the status of your stock in an ocean that's constantly changing. Well, thank you. Um, Willow, this might also be for you then, too. Uh, are there measures of uncertainty attached to each of the tools since field validation is difficult? And by tools, um, we mean the methods that you outlined. Um, well, I can definitely speak to the CARE model and the, um, e the ERAF, the, many of the um, ecosystem assessment tools that we talk about at step one, as well as the PSA at step two. Um, and I think most of the methods at steps three and five definitely have uncertainty built into them. Um, the CARE model builds it right into the calculations. Uh, Rod or Kendra, do you want to speak to any of the other methods? Yeah, um, well, well, first of all, um, one of the recommend recommendations we make when starting this whole framework is that, you know, assess what information you have at hand and move forward with that. And, and when you look at that, to see if you have different types of data streams. Because data streams can be used in different types of um, ways to ask questions about what's going on with the fisheries, whether it's fishery independent um, or more of a fishery-based metric like CPUE and maybe something from the actual uh, recording of the catch. And by combining these methods in a way that you're using different types of data streams, you're actually asking questions from basically all the way around the circle from almost every single direction of how um, a population might be influenced by the activity, the fishing activity that's going on. So that is another way to actually deal with un the uncertainty in general with data, is to actually utilize multiple methods uh, and see if they're telling the same story in, or in order to get an answer and move forward. Right, just kind of as an analog, you know, uh, if you use a complex stock assessment model, that you're feeding the model um, data streams that provide uh, glimpses or indicators of the condition of the stock. Um, and the, then the model uses complicated statistics to try to sort the signal from the noise, and that's how it deals with uncertainty. And then it'll give you an estimate of biomass or fishing mortality uh, with a cloud of points around it that are confidence intervals. So that's, uh, it's a little bit different than how these data poor methods deal with uncertainty. So in a way it's similar actually because each tool will um, generate an estimate with a cloud of points around it. So there's confidence intervals associated with each output. But then as Kendra says, it has this unique uh, feature of um, not using a statistical model to uh, interpret uh, what these data streams are telling you. It, instead, it uses human brains to do that step. And so, you know, when you get results that um, look like something like, oh, well, catch prevent effort is up from last year. That sounds good, right? Um, but wait a minute, the MPA density ratio is down. Uh, what the heck is going on? And then you ask your fishermen, can you explain this? And they say, oh yeah, you know, the, the stocks are declining. We're, we're not, you know, seeing as much of them, but our catch rates are higher because the price increased and we're just targeting the patches harder. So um, that's an example of, you know, what humans can do pretty well um, that is harder for a statistical model. That kind of structural uncertainty uh, is what we're dealing with uh, in the adaptive management uh, framework that we're, we're uh, um, uh, proposing here. Perfect. Um, can fishy be used for non-fish marine sources such as queen conch? Yeah, Kenji, you wanna, you've been thinking about conch a lot. <laughs> you want to take a shot at that? Yeah, um, so the way that fishy is designed, it can be used for to assess a resource, whether it's fished or unfished. I mean, obviously, the methods you use, um, if you don't, if it's not a fish resource, you're not going to have uh, fishery-dependent base data. But we 
we are actually using Fishy um, for Queen Conch in the Caribbean right now, working with partners um, in the country of Belize. So we've walked through this framework um, with that country and, and the government. And, and so, yeah, it can be used for all types of, of resources. And, and how you use Fishy uh, really depends on the type of questions you want to ask and the data you have at hand. But the way we've designed it is in order to, if you have different types of data streams, that you can actually have a met, an option, a method to actually ask questions about your species of interest. Right. So if you're going to try to build a what's called a deterministic model of a conch population, you'd have to know an awful lot about it. And unfortunately, conch are one of those animals that's pretty mysterious. Uh, we don't really understand much about their life history or their growth dynamics or even where they go <laughs> sometimes. Uh, and so um, sometimes in a case like that, it's better to make less assumptions and just look at what the data are telling you. And so, you know, when the conch are really, really dense in your unfished areas and really, really sparse in the fishing grounds, that's a pretty direct indicator that um, you've got problems. Uh, or if you have divers in the water and they see only little conchs and all the adults are gone, um, that's a pretty powerful indicator that the uh, adult population has been overfished and you want to back off for a while to allow those young ones to grow up. Perfect. Uh, so a quick clarifying question regarding the Spanish translations. Uh, not the whole guide yet has been translated into Spanish, but different parts of it have? There are specific tools um, that are currently in Spanish, and we, we have a, a vision of making this probably available offline in Spanish, the entire but, fishy. Yeah, the entire fishy tool. We just haven't uh, been able to find the resources to translate the whole thing. But there is quite a lot of demand for that, and so we're moving ahead with it. Awesome. Uh, so kind of piggybacking off of that, are there plans to make this available as an online service where you can submit data uh, like to your cloud and then get that data back uh, electronically? That's our dream. We, I think it would be great um, if we could uh, make it possible for people to uh, put data on the cloud. It would um, <laughs> allow a lot of different people to uh, contribute to analyses. It would allow us to look at how things are performing in the real world um, as opposed to in theory. Uh, but that's quite a, um, a ways off, I think, for Fishy. Uh, okay. Uh, also, the methods that you have for cost, uh, does that assume you're paying fishers directly, or uh, does that create a conflict of interest? Kendra, you want to take that one? Oh, wait. Can you read? Did you say methods for cost? Uh, yeah, methods for cost analysis. Uh, oh, okay. Do they assume that you're, you're paying fishermen directly, or is that creating a conflict of interest? Oh, I see. I misunderstood. So um, we don't have any methods on Fishy that look at bioeconomics. Um, if you are in the field and your fishermen uh, identify uh, maximum economic yield as their goal instead of maximum sustainable yield or something, and maximum sustainable yield is a biological sort of a concept, whereas maximum economic yield, of course, is based on uh, the difference between uh, the cost of fishing and the revenues associated with the yield. So often the, um, the biomass needs to be at a somewhat higher level than it would be if you're just trying to maximize yields. So you can use you know, these kinds of concepts um, uh, to define a goal and then run adaptive management using Fishy once you figure out performance indicators associated with that, like in this case it would be profits, you know, uh, and, and, and maybe CPUE, but we don't, um, we don't have a maximum economic yield tool on Fishy. The, um, I thought maybe the questioner was referring to the little graphical indicators of relative cost for the methods, and those don't have to do with paying fishermen. It has more to do with um, how much time and effort it would take scientists to collect the data and run that analysis. Okay, that's probably what they meant, and I probably just read it wrong. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, do marine reserves 
uh, the ability to add resiliency to a fish stock, is that taken into account uh, with the models that you have? Huh. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, CARE um, provides a mechanism, the Comprehensive Assessment of Risk Ecosystems, provides a mechanism for you to um, uh, factor that in. One of the nice things about the CARE model that Willow has built into it is that unlike other ecosystem risk assessment tools, um, it allows you to look at the interactions between things in the in the system. So, you know, not all impacts are necessarily uh, negative, and sometimes um, impacts will uh, combine to have a greater impact than the sum of the two, and sometimes it will combine in an antagonistic way and actually reduce. Uh, the impact. So marine reserves could be thought of in that way. It can also be thought of um, as a biomass reservoir. So if you're thinking about, um, you know, total risk to your fish population and you have 25% of the habitat area in a marine reserve, you can just consider that as uh, your, your spawning uh, uh, biomass there, and you, that could allow uh, higher fish mortality rates outside, but uh, none of the, well, let's see, Kendra, do you think the MPA density ratio uh, and decision tree tool can can take that into account, the effects of the marine reserve on the spawning potential? Um. The way that they exist right now, I think that it would have to be built in a little bit more. I mean, there's the, the general theory yeah. of, of, of how a marine reserve can influence the resiliency of the system itself, and specifically the yeah. fish stocks that the marine reserve is supporting. Um, right. So the general theory is there, but mathematically, um, I, I think it, it probably could be adapted a little bit more. Yeah, well, the reason I was thinking it might factor in is because with the decision tree tool that's on fishy, um, you look at the size distribution of the population and the number of mega spawners uh, in the population has a strong effect on um, what your harvest control rule will be, so as, as does the uh, frozy sustainability indicator. So if the marine reserve is doing its job, and allowing big fish to get bigger and more fecund, then the number of megaspawners in the uh, reserve should increase, of course, and then some of those will spill over. So to the extent that the big fish from the marine reserve spill over into your fishing area, um, uh, that will automatically be accounted for uh, in these decision tree tools. Excellent. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question here. Uh, so this one is about the perform fisheries performance index developed by Chris Anderson at the University of Washington and others. Uh, have you guys worked with that tool, tool at all, and do you think it would be possible to, like, merge those two together? Can you repeat the, the name of that tool? Uh, the fisheries performance index. Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the fishery perform performance indicators of the World Bank, but this sounds like it might be difficult. Those are not in this. It's not really a, a biological assessment tool. It's a more general way to get a sense of many, many, 50-some um, aspects of a, of a fisheries performance. And it, a lot of it is about social and economic performance, not biological performance. But Kendra, have you heard about that tool? No, no, I haven't, and, and I'm, I'm intrigued, so I, I thank the audience for, for bringing that up. Um, I think it's something that we could look into and, and see how it fits within our framework. Yeah, please uh, shoot us an email uh, so we can look into that. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, and we'll uh, obviously give you guys a list of all these questions afterwards so you can contact people directly, too, if you'd like. Um, and okay. with that, I think we've exercised your brains enough during this long Q&A portion. Uh, thank you so much for answering all these questions and for presenting all this information for us. This was absolutely wonderful. Um, again, to everybody in the audience, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you want to watch the recording of this, I'll have it up in about two hours on openchannels.org slash webinars. Uh, and if you need a direct link, uh, just email back Sarah Carr and the registration confirmation email you got, and she can send that to you. Uh, thanks again, everyone. And that was awesome. Bye. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you.